Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. I am Ruben Abati. I am Oji Akbe. According to the World Health Organization, the overall incident rates of childhood cancer vary between 50 and 200 per million children across the world. Joining us to discuss the prevalence of childhood cancer as it pertains to Nigeria is Dr. Adedayo Joseph, a clinical radiation oncologist who is a consultant oncologist with Lakeshore Cancer Center, the premier private cancer center in Nigeria. Dr. Joseph is a founding mem board member and the executive director of the Dorcas Center Foundation, a nonprofit organization focused on improving childhood cancer survival in Nigeria through awareness, research, and direct treatment funding. She is an executive member of the several nation and international oncology and nonprofit organization. She is also a passionate promoter of women's health issues, improvement of medical education, and cancer control policy in Nigeria. Welcome to the morning show, Dr. Day Dyer. Thank you. I was Very just saying, <laughs> what a resume. <laughs> yes, it's amazing. I was just saying, you are one of our unsung heroes. <laughs> I read your resume, and I'm, I'm really amazed at the work that you have done in saving children in Nigeria. Okay, so, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Tell us, what is it like to be a pediatric oncologist? Well, I'm actually a radiation oncologist, a clinical oncologist. Okay. You know, um, a pediatric oncologist is a pediatrician who then specializes in children's cancers. Okay. I am a medical doctor who specializes in treating cancers with chemo and radiation. I mean, I know the lines are blurry, but yes. So, well, being an oncologist, if I answer the question, being an oncologist, when I decided to um, specialize in oncology, especially in Nigeria, I had a lot of questions. Mm. And surprisingly, even from healthcare professionals, even, even from older doctors, you know, they would ask you, why would you choose that specialty? Um, but I think it's because a lot of people don't understand what goes on there. You know, people think you're going to spend your life attending to dying people, and that's not the case. You know, um, yes, cancer is difficult. You know, nobody's going to pretend that it isn't. But not all my patients die, mm. you know, so. We had some oncologists on this program. Uh, a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. They came around to Nigeria to provide training uh, for Nigerian uh, doctors who are oncologists. Mm -hmm. And after about two weeks of going around the country, uh, they were on this program. Mm -hmm. But the main thing they told us, you know, in one regard, is that early detection is very important. Mm -hmm. um, what will you be saying to people? You know, how do they notice that they have cancer? Because they were also saying that sometimes before people go for medical checkup, it will have reached an advanced uh, stage. You know, the problem is with, uh, I mean, I'm tired of talking about early detection. We go on and on about it, and it seems sometimes you wonder if your message isn't getting across. But what I've come to realize, the problem isn't just with the patient, okay. especially in children. And we have the data to prove this in Doctors Cancer Foundation. We find that, unlike with adults, you know, adults can decide to go to the doctor or not. You know, you have to go to work, so you ignore a symptom because, you know, you're so busy, you have bills to pay. It doesn't work that way with children. Children get sick. If a child is sick, she's sick. She's not going to pretend. And we found that even the uneducated, illiterate woman will take her child to somebody she believes to be a healthcare professional, you know. But what then happens is that that child is treated for malaria and for typhoid fever and for infection and for asthma. I mean, for everything under the sun before somebody thinks, okay, what else can be going on here? So you have children who first came in contact with a healthcare professional 10 months before diagnosis. You know, so with early detection, it's no longer just about the patient. It's also about the healthcare professionals as well, mm. especially do, in children. But do our public hospitals, do they have the capacity, the facilities? Right. Because most people go to public mm. hospitals. Only privileged ones will come to the you doctor know, center, you know, I believe. That's a, that's a pit that um, if we begin to go into, we will never find our ways, uh, mm. way out of it. The, the, here is the thing. Early detection is a little bit different from accurate diagnosis. Early detection means there's a symptom and someone has picked it up. Mm. Now, the next step is knowing where to refer to for a diagnosis to be made. Anywhere in the world, not every health center is equipped with high-level diagnostic equipment. Not any, any, any country in the world you go to. But you have referral systems in place. You know, so from the primary healthcare level where something is picked up to the secondary centers mm. where a diagnosis can be made and then to the tertiary centers where cancer can be treated by a multidisciplinary specialist team. And that's what that's the system that is in place in the best healthcare systems, and that's what Nigeria is trying to do. You know, the government is working. You know, I'm, I always say that people. It's easy to just say the government isn't doing anything, but they are working. But another thing that I know is that the best healthcare systems in the world aren't all government based. 
what the government can do is encourage private investment in it. You know, if you give um, importation waivers for diagnostic equipment, if you give tax breaks to hospitals, if you make sure that there's power, if you make it easy for me to put my money into healthcare, then you have private, anything that is profit driven is going to be better run. That's the truth. How do you okay. prevent cancer? <laughs> well. Or is it just an accident, a freak of nature, an accident of nature that just happens? Sometimes it is. Um, mm. Sometimes it is, but it's not really an accident. It is inevitable in terms, in, let me explain this. So your cells are constantly dividing. Um, they're constantly reproducing. And every time they divide, every now and then, something will go wrong somewhere. You know, but there are checkpoints, there are checkpoints in place to pick up those abnormalities and kill them. You know, something that you call apoptosis. It, it decides that this cell is abnormal or isn't functioning well or hasn't divided properly, and then it takes it out of the chain. Now, what happens is that something goes wrong with that checkpoint, with that inhibition. And so the abnormal cell is allowed to persist. You know, so it is an accident, but it's an accident that happens. In, so this is something I say to everybody, that everybody here, everyone here, has an aberrant cell lurking somewhere, you know. But then the next thing is, as we say, we say um, genetics loads the gun, but your lifestyle pulls the trigger. Right. So right now that. the choices you make will either allow that aberrant cell to thrive or will prevent it from thriving. So in terms of lifestyle, mm. because yes. that was the question that I was going to ask. But that works for adults, not for children. Children's cancers are different. There's okay. no lifestyle modification you can really do to prevent a childhood cancer. And you have been championing the cause against uh, the fight for uh, cancer in children. How, how did that come about and, and when did you start? <laughs> So with children, I often say that, um, I often say God tricked me mm. into it. I, I didn't intend to become a champion for childhood cancer. It wasn't, I never planned it. But what I came to find with children is that they're particularly vulnerable. You know, children don't have money. They don't have a job. They, if I'm ill, I can reach out to my family, to my friends and tell them I need help. Children don't have that. They don't have property to sell. A child who is ill that wants to get better, doesn't have a television to sell, doesn't have a piece of land to sell to pay for treatment. And in a country where 90% of treatment funding is out of pocket. But they have parents who can do who can Yes, but cancer treatment can be very, very expensive. Right. Very few people off the streets can afford to pay for a full course of cancer treatment. You know, you're talking about millions. And how many people can afford that in Nigeria? Now, this, the second vulnerability with children is not just about money. It's also about decision making. I have met children who are ill. Mm. And you can see that this child wants you to help her. But then the family members decide that, no, they'd rather take her to um, a traditional healer in the village. Mm -hmm. Or they decide that they're not willing to invest all of their life savings into care for this child. They tell you that she has cancer, she's not going to live. And we have four other children at home to look after. So I why know. are we going to put everything, sell all our property, do everything? Now? You know, it sounds cruel, you know, but that's what happens when you have a society where um, there's nobody fighting for the kids. What steps can parents take to ensure that their children are getting the adequate screening that they need for early detection? With children, there's no screening, okay. unfortunately, because you only screen for things that you can prevent. Mm. You know, there's no screening for childhood cancer. Mm. What you can do is, if a child has any of the symptoms of cancer, or if a child is repeatedly ill and isn't getting better, the first step I tell people is make sure that you're seeing a pediatrician. You know, make sure you're seeing a specialist, and then get a second opinion. If you've gone to this doctor three times and you have the same problem and he isn't getting better, ask him to refer you for a second opinion. You know, any good doctor is happy to do that. And even if he doesn't, you get up and go find a second opinion elsewhere. You know, don't go back to the same place to receive the same treatment that isn't making things better. You are a radiation oncologist, right? Yes, I am. I guess that means you administer chemotherapy. Yes, I do. Okay, Clinical I wanted oncology. us to simplify it for the benefit of chemotherapy people. Chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Yes. Now. How much of a threat do you think religiosity in Nigeria or spirituality poses to treatment of cancer? Because I see on TV, some people will say, oh, they went to this church, uh, this cancer doctor told me that this will happen, this will not, but I, I got a miracle from uh, God. At the risk of sounding unspiritual, because I am spiritual, the truth is that religion is one of the major threats to healthcare mm. in Nigeria. I've been in church, you know, with my partner, and someone is giving a testimony, and I'm whispering, we're not the enemy. You know, they come and they give these testimonies about how the doctor said they're not going to get better, and then they did something and they got better, and I'm saying, the doctor was telling you what is scientific. She, I mean, she's not a magician, but she's talking to you based on data and facts. The problem with religion we have is that we look at it the wrong way, you know? I, th I tell people that be thankful that there's treatment. 
and pray that the treatment will, because there are people who will take the treatment and it simply doesn't work. So be thankful that there's treatments available and then your prayer should be directed towards making sure that this treatment does the work it's meant to do. It's not about you refusing treatment and then going home to lie down on your bed and pray. Mm -hmm. the, your prayers have been answered already, but you've chosen not to receive the answer to the prayer. You know, I see it a lot. I can't tell you how many times patients have said to me they won't take chemo, they don't want to take treatments, they're, they're going to church, their pastor is praying. I have seen pastors who are on chemotherapy, so I don't know what you mean when you tell me that you're going to look, you know, so it, it is a big threat. I, I wouldn't well, like Nigeria has a health insurance scheme, mm. right? Uh, from your experience, do you think that is working? Because earlier on you talked about out-of-pocket uh, payment for healthcare. Why should people still be dependent on out-of-pocket when we have an insurance scheme? E everywhere in the world, cancer treatment is very expensive. And it is, it is uncommon to find a health insurance system that will cover all of cancer care for mm. anyone, for any patient. Um, we do have a health insurance scheme. It does have its struggles. But it's, I mean, I have seen um, one or two patients who have received their treatment off of the NHIS. Um, but they had to, I think, apply specially in writing. It was a long process. And especially when you're treating someone with cancer, you don't have three months mm. to wait for approval for treatment. You know, so yes, it does have its struggles, but we will keep working to make it better. That's, that's, that's all I can okay, say about that. For the benefit of our few viewers here in Lagos, what are the health facilities, at least here in Lagos, that um, you can say that adequately has the um, clinical equipment for cancer treatment for children in I always ask people to go to a teaching hospital. Teaching, you know, like yes. in Luth? Like Luth, like okay. Luth, like Lasso, the teaching hospitals. I consult in a private um, cancer center, Lakeshore Cancer Center. That's the only um, dedicated cancer center we have right now in Lagos State. And we do have, I mean, quite a few excellent success stories. You know, but the, the truth is, if you are in a center, the important thing is to make sure that you're seeing an oncologist. You know, if you're not being attended to by an oncologist, you're already set on the wrong path. That's the unfortunate thing. So for me, it is both the specialist and the center. Quickly touch on the Dorcas Foundation. I know that you, are, you have been raising funds for this, and um, how can people donate to your cause and, and um, tell, tell, tell our viewers how they can Okay, so on. we have a website, right. cdcf.ng, where um, all your answers, all your questions can be answered and where you can reach us. You know, what is it called? TDCF, the Dorcas Cancer Foundation, okay. .ng, TDCF. Ng. Um, we have an email address, info at tdcf.ng, and we have phone numbers that are there on the website. Um, we're always very happy to find partners. It's, it's not always about donating money. Sometimes it's just attending the support group meetings. It's spending time with the children, coming on a play date with the kids. There's so many ways to be involved with us and to help, and every little bit makes a difference. You know, I'm always very... For me, one of the easiest things is to ask people, just come to the ward, because I find that once they come there, they can't stay away anymore. I don't need to convince you any longer. The minute you spend time with those children, you're going to spend the rest of your days thinking, okay, how can I help again? How can I go back again? And that's what happened to me. So I see it happen to other people all the time. Just as well. before we let you go, September is the Cancer Awareness Month. Yes. Yeah, what will you be saying to our viewers, particularly in Nigeria and other parts of Africa, about cancer? There are three things I say regarding childhood cancer. It, it, it is real. Cancer in children does exist. It can be treated. It has an excellent prognosis. Cancer in children has a better prognosis than adult cancers when okay. they're properly treated. Um, make sure that you're treated by an oncologist. Those are the three things I always tell okay, people. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. It was Adeda quite a pleasure to have you here. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's, all. Yeah. that's all from Dr. Adedayo Joseph. When we come back, female presidential aspirant Elishama Ide will be joining us in the studios. Stay with us.